Hello everyone and welcome to our module on the complement system. The complement system is a collection of proteins that circulates in the bloodstream. It can also be found in tissues. And these proteins can bind to pathogens that get inside the body, especially bacteria. Once they bind to pathogens like bacteria, the result is bacterial cell death. And they go by various names like C3 for complement protein C and C5 and C6. Sometimes they also have a letter like C3A and C3B. Of all the different complement proteins, the most abundant is C3. It's synthesized by the liver, and it can be converted to C3B. And when stable C3B binds to bacteria, this leads to bacterial cell death. And all the different pathways of activation of the complement system involve the conversion of C3 to C3B. The complement system can be hard to remember and even to understand as a medical student. My suggestion for the way to do this is to think of the entire complement system as the conversion of C3 to C3B, and then C3B leading to the destruction of bacteria. As we will see, there are three different pathways by which C3 can be converted to C3B. One is called the alternative pathway, the other is the classical, and the other is the lectin. Once stable C3B is formed by any one of these three pathways, the next steps in complement activation are all the same. They involve formation of something called the membrane attack complex, which leads to bacterial cell death. So let's talk about those three pathways of C3 to C3B conversion. The first one is the easiest one to understand, and this is the alternative pathway. And the reason it's easy to understand is because this simply involves the spontaneous conversion of C3 to C3B. There is a low level of spontaneous conversion to C3B happening all the time in the blood and in the tissues. Now, if C3B is not stabilized by binding to something, it will be rapidly destroyed. In fact, it gets destroyed in less than a second. However, C3B can sometimes be stabilized if it binds to amino and hydroxyl groups. These are commonly found on the surfaces of pathogens. This is an amino group here, this is a hydroxyl group here, and there are lots of these sticking out of the surfaces of common pathogens. As an example of some of the surfaces that can bind and stabilize C3B, these include bacterial lipopolysaccharides, fungal cell walls, and viral envelopes. So if one of these is present inside the body, C3B will stick to it and become stabilized, and thus you will have the conversion of C3 to C3B via the alternative pathway. The reason stable C3B is so effective via the alternative pathway is because stable C3B can create more of itself via a positive feedback loop. The way this works is that stable C3B binds to something called complement protein B. And then there is another complement protein called protein D, which can clip B that is bound to C3B. This creates a molecule called C3BBB, and C3B is a C3 convertase, which can make more C3B. So the result of all this is that once the alternative pathway creates stable C3B via binding to one of those surfaces I just mentioned, the stable C3B can cleave more C3 into C3B. The result is a rapid accumulation of lots of C3B on surfaces. And I've drawn a picture of this down here to help you understand. Once you get some stable C3B via the alternative pathway, proteins B and D can make that C3 convertase right here, which converts C3 into C3B, and then you get a positive feedback loop. Some alternative pathway C3B can bind to our own cells, and if left unchecked, it could activate the complement system and lead to cell death of our own human cells. But this doesn't happen, and one of the reasons is because of something called factor H. Factor H is a plasma glycoprotein that is synthesized in the liver, and it blocks the alternative pathway on our own host cells. Our cells have developed mechanisms to pull factor H from the plasma and use it to protect themselves against the alternative pathway. Factor H does a couple of things that protect our own cells. It can accelerate the decay of C3 convertase, that C3 BBB I just told you about, in addition, factor H can cleave and inactivate surface-bound C3B. What's interesting is there are some cancer cells and bacteria that have evolved mechanisms to pull factor H from the plasma and use it themselves to evade the alternative pathway. Some of the key pathogens that can do this include H influenza, and that's easy to remember because it starts with the letter H, also Neisseria meningitidis, many streptococci, and Pseudomonas. And there's a nice review article down on the bottom of the screen here if you want to read more about all the mechanisms by which cancer cells and bacteria use factor H to evade the alternative pathway. The next pathway by which C3 converts to C3B is called the lectin pathway. There is a molecule that circulates in blood and tissues called mannose binding lectin. It's produced by the liver and it circulates together with proteases called mannose associated serine proteases or MASPs. 
These complexes of the binding lectin together with the proteases can bind to surfaces that contain mannose, and many microbes have surfaces that contain mannose. Once the complexes bind, they will convert a complement protein called C2 into C2B. They will also convert a complement protein called C4 into C4B, and then the C2 and C4B will bind together to form C2B, C4B, and this molecule is a C3 convertase. A C3 convertase is an enzyme that can convert C3 into C3B. So once you have formation of this structure, C3B will begin to form, and that leads to formation of the MAC and destruction of bacteria. The alternative and the lectin pathways are both examples of innate immunity. They do not involve the adaptive immune system, and they don't involve B cells or T cells or antibodies. But the third and final way by which C3 gets converted to C3B does involve adaptive immunity. This pathway is called the classical pathway, and it has to do with complement activation by way of antigen-antibody complexes. Some antigen-antibody complexes can bind a complement protein called C1. We'll talk more about C1 in a minute. But C1 can cleave C2 into C2B, and it can cleave C4 into C4B. And then once again, just like in the lectin pathway, C2B, C4B can become a C3 convertase, and in this way it can convert C3 into C3B, and from there you can go on to kill bacteria. So let's talk about the C1 component of the complement system, which is involved in the classic pathway. It's a very important complement protein. C1 is a large complex, and it consists of several different molecules together. It consists of C1Q, C1R, C1S, and a C1 inhibitor. I've drawn an example of its structure down here. It's a very large molecule, and it contains the CR portion right here, the CS portion right here, and this is the C1 inhibitor. In order for C1 to activate via the classic pathway, it must bind to two FC portions of antibodies which are close together. When two FC portions bind to the C1 complex, the C1 inhibitor will fall off. Once this happens, C1R and C1S become activated, and then they will create that C3 convertase, which is C2B and C4B. Once you understand this principle that two FC portions have to be close together in order to activate C1 and the classic pathway, you can then begin to understand why IgM is such a good complement activator. So the IgM antibody is a pentamer. It's got five monomers that are bound together like this with their FAB portion sticking out. And as a result of having five monomers stuck together, you have lots of FC portions right near each other here. Therefore, it's very easy for IgM to bind to C1 and knock off the inhibitor molecule with all these FC portions close together. IgG is an okay complement activator, but it's not as good as IgM, and that's because in order for IgG to activate the complement system, you have to get two IgG molecules close together so that their FC portions are near each other, and then they can bind C1 and knock off that inhibitor so that C1 can begin to activate complement via the classic pathway. You may have heard of a molecule called C-reactive protein, or CRP. It's called an acute phase reactant because its level rises in the setting of inflammation. The liver synthesizes CRP in response to IL-6 secretion from macrophages. And C-reactive protein has been shown to bind to bacterial polysaccharides. In fact, it gets its name because it binds to C polysaccharides of bacteria. And you should know that C-reactive protein has been shown to have some unusual effects on the classic pathway. It can activate the early classical pathway by binding to C1 and cause consumption of C3 and C4, and it can generate some C3B. However, interestingly, it does not activate the late pathway, so we'll talk about formation of the MAC and consumption of C5 to C9 in a minute, but all you need to know right now is that CRP has been shown to not activate this portion of complement. It's very unlikely you'll be asked on step one exactly what CRP does in terms of the complement system because its functions are still being worked out. There's an article down here if you want to read a summary of all the studies that have been done, but you should be aware that C-reactive protein is an acute phase reactant synthesized in response to IL-6 and you should know that it can bind to C1. When C3 is converted to C3B, it splits off a small molecule called C3A, and C3A has some effects on the immune system of its own. C3A is called an anaphylatoxin, and that's because it's been shown to stimulate histamine release from mast cells and increase vascular permeability, and it may be a component that leads to anaphylaxis. In addition, I told you that C3B can lead to formation of the MAC, which leads to bacterial cell death. We're going to talk about how that happens in a minute. But you should also know that C3B just by itself can act as an opsonin for macrophages and draw macrophages into the sites of complement activation.
So back to our overview slide of the complement system, I told you that the complement system can be best understood by thinking of it as a series of methods for converting C3 to C3B, and we've talked about the three ways that happens. The alternative pathway is very easy because it's just spontaneous conversion of C3 to C3B. The lectin pathway involves binding to mannose on the surface of microbes and creation of the C2B-C4B convertase, which then converts C3 into C3B. And then finally, the classic pathway involves antibody bindings to C1, which also creates the C3 convertase C2B-C4B, which then converts C3 into C3B. So now we've talked about these three ways of creating C3B. Now let's talk about what happens once you have stable C3B created, and that involves formation of the membrane attack complex, which will kill bacteria. The membrane attack complex is formed by the complement protein C5 through C9. These are sometimes called the late complement proteins or the terminal complement proteins because they come at the end of all the pathways. The way they form the MAC is drawn in this picture here. So C3B will cleave C5 into C5A and C5B, and then C5B will bind to C6, C7, C8, and C9, and together they will form the MAC. What the membrane attack complex does is it pokes holes in bacterial cell walls, and the bacteria will swell and burst, and that's how they die. Just like when C3 was converted to C3B, it split off a smaller protein, the same thing is true of C5. When C5 is converted to C5B to go on to form the MAC, it splits off a smaller protein called C5A. And C5A is an anaphylatoxin. It has the same properties as C3A. It can stimulate histamine release and increase vascular permeability, leading to anaphylaxis. In addition, C5A has a special property. It's a neutrophil chemotaxis agent, so it can draw neutrophils into the sites of complement activation. So back to our overview slide, now we've seen that there are three pathways for the conversion of C3 to C3B. Then we've seen how C3B can go on to form the membrane attack complex. And we've also seen that this process splits off two important molecules, C3A and C5A, which are anaphylatoxins and can draw other cells into the site of complement activation. And clinically, this process is most important for fighting off bacteria, especially encapsulated bacteria. The complement system is a major way we defend ourselves against these pathogens. And as we shall see, when you are deficient in an element of the complement system, the problem you usually have is recurrent bacterial infections. The reason the complement system doesn't bind to and destroy our own cells in the body is because they have different structures from bacteria, and in addition, there are membrane proteins that protect human cells. Two of the most important ones are called delay accelerating factor or MAC inhibitory protein. Delay accelerating factor is often called DAF, it's also called CD55 and MAC inhibitory protein is also called CD59. DAF disrupts the attachment of C3B so that it can't proceed with formation of the MAC, and CD59 directly disrupts the MAC. And these are especially important for protecting red blood cells because patients who are deficient in DAF or CD59 have problems with hemolysis. So let's talk about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH. This is the syndrome that patients get when they are born with rare deficiencies in DAF or CD59. The primary problem is red blood cell lysis because they lack those protective proteins on their surface and they have complement-mediated lysis of red blood cells. This obviously will lead to anemia. In addition, it will lead to the spillage of hemoglobin into the bloodstream and finally into the urine. That's why they get hemoglobinuria and this can lead to renal failure. A second set of problems they get comes from the free plasma hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is thrombogenic when it's present in high levels in the plasma, and this can lead to thrombosis. In addition, hemoglobin binds nitric oxide, and this will deplete nitric oxide from the tissues of their body. The result is that they will have increased smooth muscle tone, and this leads to several of the symptoms of PNH. The first one is erectile dysfunction. In particular, people with PNH can get something called priapism, where they have sustained painful and prolonged erections. In addition, they can have dysphagia from abnormal muscle tone in the esophagus, and they can get spasms of abdominal pain from the high smooth muscle tone in the abdomen. Classically, PNH patients have sudden episodes of hemolysis at night, so they'll awake with abdominal pain and their urine will be discolored from the hemolysis. They often have fatigue and dyspnea. This is a result of the anemia, and they often have abdominal pain from smooth muscle tension. In addition, they get thrombosis in very unusual locations like the portal vein, the mesenteric veins, or the cerebral veins. Thrombosis is the leading cause of death, and as you can see from all these locations here, it's usually venous clots that occur. Now let's talk about other disorders where there is abnormal complement system function, and the first one we'll talk about is an inherited C3 deficiency. So as we saw before, C3 is really central to the entire complement system. So if you're deficient in this protein, you essentially lack 
a functioning complement system. And as a result, you're vulnerable to the most important pathogens that complement defends against, and those are encapsulated bacteria. So children born with a C3 deficiency will develop recurrent pneumococcal and H-flu pneumonia beginning in infancy. A second problem they have is with autoimmune diseases, and this sounds counterintuitive. These children lack a portion of the immune system, yet they have higher rates of autoimmune disease. How can this be the case? Well, the pathophysiology has to do with immune complex deposition. So recall that immune complexes are antigens bound to an antibody, usually an IgG antibody, and these sometimes form in the plasma and they can deposit in tissue. A major way that they are cleared are by complement activation and the formation of C3B on their surface. Recall that C3B can draw in macrophages because they have complement receptors. So when you're deficient in the complement system, you can't form this C3B and you can't draw in macrophages, and as a result, you have impaired clearance of immune complexes. So children with an inherited C3 deficiency get glomerular nephritis from immune complex deposition in their kidneys. They also have higher rates of other type 3 hypersensitivity syndromes, and recall that type 3 hypersensitivity disorders always involve immune complex formation. Another rare set of disorders are those that involve the terminal complement pathway, so this involves deficiency in C5 through C9. So just like the children who are deficient in C3, these children have impaired defense against encapsulated bugs. However, they do still have C3A, which is an anaphylatoxin, and they also have C3B, which is an opsonin for macrophages, so they're not quite as bad off as the children who are C3 deficient. What children with a terminal complement pathway deficiency develop are recurrent Neisseria infections. For reasons that aren't completely understood, Neisseria seems to be the worst offender in people who have this type of deficiency. So these children will present with recurrent episodes of Neisseria meningitis. Another disorder that involves the complement system is called hereditary angioedema, and people with hereditary angioedema are deficient in the C1 inhibitor protein. Recall that I told you before that the C1 complex contains several molecules. One of them is the C1 inhibitor protein. The symptoms of this disorder have little to do with the complement system. The reason they occur is because this C1 inhibitor protein has many functions beyond the complement system. And one of those functions is to break down bradykinin, which is a vasodilator. So if you are deficient in the C1 inhibitor protein, the problem you have is high levels of bradykinin, and this leads to recurrent episodes of swelling and edema. This is a picture of a child with angioedema. You can see how there's puffiness and swelling around her eye. Now you can get this bee stings and other type of reactions, but this also occurs in hereditary angioedema, and it's dangerous because it can involve the entire face and even the throat and the tongue, and then people can have problems breathing. So the symptoms begin in childhood, and these patients have recurrent episodes of swelling, like what I showed you on the last slide. And importantly, they will not have urticaria because urticaria is mediated by histamine and doesn't occur in this type of swelling. There can be swelling of the skin, but also internal portions of the body, like the GI tract and the upper airway, and the airway swelling is what can be fatal. You can diagnose hereditary angioedema by identifying a low C4 level in the plasma. Because there's a lack of C1 inhibitor, you will get consumption of C4. C1 is always active in these patients, so they have low C4 levels. And you can treat this by giving these patients a C1 inhibitor concentrate. Interestingly, epinephrine doesn't work very well, so when these patients come into emergency rooms, they're often treated for an allergic reaction, but that doesn't respond. A very high-yield feature of hereditary angioedema for board exams is to know the fact that these patients should never be given an ACE inhibitor. Recall that ACE inhibitors block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. They're used as antihypertensives and they're used in heart failure. But they also block the breakdown of bradykinin, and this is what leads to two of their important side effects. One is cough and one is angioedema. So people with hereditary angioedema have very high levels of bradykinin all the time, and if you give them an ACE inhibitor, you can precipitate an acute episode of swelling, which can potentially be life-threatening. So as I've written at the bottom of the screen, never give ACE inhibitors to patients with hereditary angioedema. There's an autoantibody found in glomerular disease called C3 nephritic factor. It's an autoantibody that stabilizes C3 convertase, and this leads to overactivation of the classical pathway. This autoantibody is found in over 80% of patients who have membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis type 2. I talk about this in more detail in the renal modules. It leads to inflammation and hypocomplementemia from overactivation of the complement pathway. Finally, let me finish by explaining the ways we clinically test the complement system. The first one is a test called CH50. In this test, the patient's serum is added to sheep red blood cells with antibodies, and the goal is for the classical pathway to lyse the sheep red blood cells. You need all of your complement factors C1 to C9 for a normal result. 
The result is reported in units per milliliter. It's complicated to understand how they get this number, but basically you dilute the patient's serum to see how far you have to dilute it to lyse 50% of the red blood cells. That's why it's called a CH50 test. This is just a qualitative test to tell you yes or no that the complement system is working. The second test is quantitative. This is where we directly measure C3 or C4 levels. And the reason we do this is because these levels are low in many complement-mediated diseases from consumption. So for example, you can find low C3 or C4 levels in lupus and lupus nephritis, in membranoproliferative glomerular disease, and in post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So finding a low complement level sometimes helps you make one of these diagnoses. And that concludes our module on the complement system.